Okay. Well, how are you today? I'm doing well. We yeah, it's like it's a it's a, a, a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for um, t- um oh. inviting me to talk with you today. It's a it's a nice day here in San Francisco. <laughs> Well, it's a beautiful day, but hot here in Greenville, South Carolina. And I'm Martha Senator, and I want to welcome Carolyn Kabating to the Audio Garden here at Listen and Be Heard. And I'm really thrilled to have you here, Carolyn. We have been playing um, cuts from Sue Gillanon through several episodes of season two, and we're coming back um, in September, and it's a pleasure to actually have a conversation with you about that CD. Thank you, Martha. I'm so happy to be on the show and so happy to uh, finally get a chance to meet you in person. Yes. And, of course, I've spent time out in the Bay Area. I don't know if you're familiar with Listen and Be Heard in its Bay Area iteration, but we actually had a weekly newspaper for a while and a poetry cafe coming out of Vallejo, California, Oh, and wow. um, it was nice to live out there. I mean, it's beautiful, but there's also such a wonderful um, jazz scene still in the Bay Area. And you're part of that very vibrant scene. And this yeah. CD, Sugilanon, it's like such an interesting marriage of cultures and art forms. And so I want to briefly say from you know looking at your publicity and everything else and of course having listened to the cd that yes. uh it's it's an epic story based on yes. um, the kalinka tradition of epic stories and yes. we're a show for um readers and writers so i wanted to kind of start from that angle just talking about what this meant to you, it's your epic story of your family, and yet it has a a universal appeal as well as I think um, you've mentioned that other families feel that it's in many ways their story too. Yes, thank you. Um, It I have been um, for decades uh, a student of ancestral culture of the Philippines. As a fourth generation Filipino American, uh, my family came here in 1904. You have, to, in order to sort of like get some sort of foundation in terms of the ancestral culture, you know, it's it's a uh, or for me as a musician, it was part of my journey to study and to really learn about their culture to sort of get a foundation for myself living in this country. And uh, one of the things that the Kalinga culture had that is very important for them to understand themselves as Kalinga people and their history and um, and why they are as they are ethically, morally, and as a community is through their epic poem, Di Ulalam. And Di Ulalam literally translates to the story. And um, in studying that wonderful poem about uh, their heroes and how their their heroes are not considered to them as um, metaphors, they they do believe that these were actual people, and so that they're telling the stories of like ancestors and you know and uh, that mm-hmm. lived hundreds of years ago. I was inspired to actually create what I felt was an epic poem of my own family over um, three generations, and Sugilanon actually translates similarly to story in the in the ethno-linguistic Sugi group of my Lanon. own family. I've, I've been saying that incorrectly. I apologize. Oh, no, that's okay. Can you repeat that for me one more um, time? Yes, Sugi Lanon. Okay, that sounds very musical and beautiful Thank when you. said like that. And I think um, I, I'm wondering, how is the language... Um, in, in your experience, because I, I have this sense, I think you wrote all of the lyrics and the story in this CD. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So I do, I have this sense that maybe it's always sort of been related for you. I know that um, if I try to memorize a song, the first thing I'll do, a melody, is I'll learn the words because somehow knowing the story helps me learn the song. And I just wondered what kind of relationship you have 
as a musician with the with the lyrics and the words. Ah, thank you, Martha. You know, my primary instrument, even though I'm a a traditional Philippine percussionist, dancer, and um, and composer of jazz, my first instrument always has been. Um, vocals. And uh, one thing that um, mm-hmm. one of my uh, wonderful teachers uh, when I was uh, coming up and learning said is that the uniqueness of the of the vocalist as an instrumentalist is that he or she has the privilege of interpreting the lyric. And that is your first mm. responsibility, which always struck me as that was so powerful, you know, and so the lyric has always been first and foremost on my my mind that even when I was interpreting or singing the great um, songs of other composers, I was telling a story. And I always have been, you know, as a vocalist. Mm-hmm. So um, that mm-hmm. is how I've approached it is that the lyrics have always been very important because it was always it was not just a tool to get melodies and, and uh, rhythm out. It was actually the most important part of a vocalist's job is to actually be a storyteller. So in the Mm. writing of, uh, you know, so for years I had been interpreting, I had been feeling story, trying to convey story. So when it came time for me to uh, work on, you know, my first, um, you know, basically album of, of compositions, the words were very important, the lyrics of the the songs and also the poetry. And the poetry is actually also paying respects to the protocol of traditional Kalinga culture, they see their world in seven as opposed to us seeing our world in eight. So um, it, mm-hmm. when the, when a poem is uh, written, uh, there are seven syllables in a line, and each um, line of a stanza, there are seven. So the rhymes are um, a, a little different from how we see it in eight. It's like it alternates lines, and then the very last um, set is uh, the same rhyme. And uh, and so I decided to honor that. So as I was telling the story mm-hmm. of really m- pretty much all of these little verses or these mini poems as part of the bigger epic poem is a story about um, uh, an aspect of my community or an individual of my family. But I wanted to use the protocol of Kalinga in doing that it, it, with both the challenge and also somehow communing with that kind of feel of um, seven. Just through the form itself. Yes. That, that alignment with the culture, I yes. think. Yes. Yes. I, I, now, this brings up another question, because you're actually an expert at this point on pre-colonial Philippine music and culture. Um, I think that's how you've described it. Um, yeah, I, and I actually, yes. I'll just correct that just a little bit in the sense that go, I go am, ahead, please. I, yes, I would like to say that I'm a, a humble student, continuing to be, um, and if I'm doing anything in America, I'm actually stewarding the uh, the culture as I learn it, and that I make sure that I am in connection with the true culture bearers of the Philippines. So this is a, a relationship mm-hmm. that is maintained like an annual basis of making sure that I'm honest, because I'm not actually um, representing my culture. I'm ap- representing their culture. Even though we are Filipino people, mm-hmm. it is actually, I'm not born in the village. I am, you know, just a humble. So and, and expert was probably a wrong choice of words. But nevertheless, you have been studying this yes. for 30 years. Yes. And I would like to say my steward. To the Philippines. Yes. Yes. That's a wonderful word. I just wondered, though, you you have a specific way of describing that culture. How would you describe jazz? Oh, jazz, and and why there's even the linkages is because I see jazz in its most, um, because it isn't, it has expanded and grown. It's not pre-colonial. No, it's not. But what it is, is improvisational with the opportunity for Mm -hmm. soloists to actually interpret um, a melody. Mm -hmm. basically a melody and even like lyrics so that is the commonality as I see it of jazz it isn't necessarily a feel because so many cultures and subcultures of jazz have actually expanded the feel of jazz it isn't just swing it could be Afro-Cuban jazz it can be Brazilian jazz and in my um, approach to a Filipino American jazz aesthetic I'm wanting to bring in some of the um, melodic and also um, uh, percussive and uh, rhythmic motifs of ancestral Philippine culture and infuse it into 
jazz music or improvisational music in America. Which, to my ear, you have done in a very, like, I don't know, funky yet, you know, jazzy kind of wonderful way. I, I have to say, I really enjoy, like, the whole progression of the story. And it start the CD starts in the first cut with a very kind of traditional, I'm assuming, Philippine sound with yes. the bells, which is which is wonderful. I don't know what what do you call those? I called them bells, uh, but probably yes. You and don't. The, um, oh, either that that is uh, the music of the Kuling Tang Ensemble, and they mm -hmm. are a, a set of graduated gongs, about eight of them, that are played almost like a xylophone, and the accompanying mm -hmm. instruments that surround it, the drums and the bigger gongs. And I think that for American folks, we are more familiar with the gamelan orchestras of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, of Indonesia, so but and we are related to that in in terms of the Southeast Asian, you know, um, uh, instruments. Filipinos have a unique, uh, you know, uh, you know, perspective of the um, gong chime, you know, um, uh, ensembles. But then our closest relative would be uh, the gamelan. Uh huh. And so, I found myself asking myself now. How much of this is like traditional, traditional, and how much of this have you turned into your own, as you described it, like Filipino American jazz? I stay in terms of like the instrumentation and how you've presented it in in this CD. That's a great question, and I I like to say that instead of saying that my music is inspired by ancestral Philippine music, I like to actually take that one step further and say it is informed by ancestral Philippine mm -hmm. music. And and that's a choice because it's possible that I could take these beautiful instruments and just create creative rhythms that sound beautiful. They are beautiful instruments. But for me, having studied for decades, I actually wanted to make sure that in this album, the instruments were playing in the way that they have been familiar with for generations. So um, everything that you're hearing when I'm, um, singing the uh, in the traditional language at the very beginning of some songs that was also um that's actually a, a melodic line that exists in um in traditional culture and then the song afterwards the um the jazz song was actually inspired by that original melody even though it took off later on what you're hearing in terms of the instruments um, being played they're playing in the traditional manner and the Western instruments are um, are aligning with uh, the the rhythmic motifs, or even the um, melodic and the um, uh, the tones. So, like that, if I have string instruments, they are actually tuning up to the gongs. You know that type of thing. So to I like to say that I it's see. informed. Yeah, informed by traditional. Uh -huh. That I'm really not, you know, banging on gongs. I'm actually remembering everything that I had been taught on how the ensemble should be played yeah that that's that's how i'd like to describe it that that i'm, I'm Interesting. honoring um, that's a great <laughs> description i think and so let's get into the story a bit i think when we were going back and forth about this interview i had asked you to pick maybe one cut that you wanted to talk about a little more deeply and so this is the story of your family yes essentially and their journey um, to San Francisco and the progressive generations that have, you know, survived and overcome and hopefully yes. enjoyed as well. Yes. Um, it, was there one in particular that, that we wanted to talk about that I could also play for our audience? Absolutely. I think it fits just fine with its accompanying mm -hmm. um, uh, verse, which is uh, Fred. Uh, so that would be track number 11, Fred, followed by number 12, fits just fine. And this is the story okay. of my grandfather. And um, uh, uh, Fernando um, Obungin, who, um, in order to make life easier when he came to America, changed his name to Fred, which was uh, much more um, easier to um, understand. And in growing, I knew him as, as opposed to like, I did not know personally my great grandparents, but my grandfather, right. Fred, I knew him and he was um, a, a, a man who was like 
strong. He was a strong union man, but he had such a great sense of humor, and he made us laugh. And he was very, and he was a great cook. And um, all of us grandchildren, he would be theatrical in his cooking for us. And so he's very close to my heart. This is a really um, so his poem is all about how he was, um, you know, that that whimsical character that no matter what was going on when he had first come to America in 1930s, and it was rough. This was pre-civil rights movement and how um, people of color were um, dealt with and seen um, was, uh, you know, they saw the worst in in many ways of, uh, of right. um, you know, racist America, and he survived that. And he's, and, and when yes. was the period of time when the, when, I think there was a period of time when the women were not actually allowed to even come? Yes. To America, um, is that yes, correct? Yes, when um, the, in the agricultural, the cannery um, uh, industries of America during the, I think the the late 1920s through the 1930s and even 40s, they were in need of stoop labor. That Native um, Americans, um, you know, Native uh, not na- Native Americans, um, Indian Americans, but but just Americans, Americans, yeah, just Americans yeah. didn't really want to um, uh, apply for and and work at. So there were three right. waves of Asians that were actually recruited as stoop labor. You know, I think the first um, was Japanese and then Chinese. And then the last was um, Filipinos. And they were they right. came to this country as young men with the intent of having them work as stoop labor. So no, um, uh, no women were recruited, no families were recruited, no married couples and children were recruited. So this is why... So it was lonely times. It was lonely, well. and in many ways, um, with the combination of anti-miscegenation laws, many of these communities ended up becoming bachelor societies. And so my right. grandfather came, you know, with his two cousins in that wave as stoop labor. He mm-hmm. was very fortunate and very lucky that um, he ended up finding and marrying one of the few uh, Filipina women that was born in this country, which was my grandmother. And mm. so the whole trajectory of his life, which would be uh, becoming an elder as a bachelor, became something different, that he became a father and a mm-hmm. grandfather, property owner, you know, um, all the things that, um, you know, he, despite a lot of challenges, he kept a very positive attitude and in many ways did have like the American dream. Um, and he also was a very strong union advocate. And all of us were raised in my family to actually be very, um, to think about the rights of the working class because that is where he um, he came from and to always um, be a strong union family and to always understand that we were Americans and that one of our, our you know our greatest privileges having come from a country where that was not a privilege was to vote and to have our voice heard mm-hmm. and to not let anyone tell you you were not an American and so this is this is that relative that I wanted to feature and um, while at the same time he was also the most positive and upbeat person that um, that I knew as well. The the song starts off with traditional, you know, melody and traditional language. And then it becomes, you know, the jazz song. And, um, and so in that way, both language and, um, and a traditional melody were, um, were respected and honored before coming into the the uh, the new composition. And it has um, the the wonderful solo of um, Malesio Magdaluyo to to also emphasize the fact that first and foremost, jazz music is improvisational music and the ability of an individual mm-hmm. to interpret that melody and to um, express and bring life to the song in his own unique way, and um, yeah, that's that's um, fits just fine. That's the, wonderful. <laughs> I wonder, do you see yourself in a line? There, I know there's. Um, really been quite a few Filipino jazz musicians yes. and maybe you could just talk a little about um, wh- where you come from in that tradition or, or where you see yourself fitting in or who's been your influence yes, in that way. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, ever since that music was developed, the Philippines actually fell in love with it. So even if you were to go to the Philippines now, jazz is is something that's still like really revered and and you can get you can be, see these and hear these wonderful jazz musicians. And and as um our community came to America, particularly during the 30s and 40s, 
they many of them were musicians and many of them were um, were performing jazz and and really studying the music from that um, perspective a lot of um, uh, Lu, uh, Monaco Luis, who is who is actually honored by being on the album as my bass player, was one of my mentors. He's mm-hmm. one of my elders who taught me everything that I should know about how to be a singer, how to be um, a team player, um, and and everything that he know knew from like having been uh, a musician that came up through the ranks in the 1960s. Malesio Magdaloyo is still one of my mentors that he is the featured soloist on this song as well. And um, just, and these are two gentlemen that never ne- didn't necessarily compose with um, having a Filipino American, you know, uh, jazz aesthetic. They were, they were just American guys who happened to be Filipino jazz. and yes, and they were just jazz music, right. not just, but they were just um, honoring the music as, um, as jazz musicians. And, um, and, mm-hmm. And, and yet they came and and developed it so well and had such a, a wonderful expression and um, and took me under their wing. So I would say that, you know, my direct um, lineage is Monaco Luis, Malesio Magdaluyo. Um, but then also my lineage includes, um, you know, jazz musicians that are um, not necessarily Filipino, but then who have been my teachers, like my producer, Wayne mm-hmm. Wallace who's like an Ameri- uh, amazing oh, yeah, yes. Latin American jazz. Bay, Bay yeah. Area fixture. Yes, yes. Wayne Wallace. I saw him at the Vallejo Jazz Festival years ago, and that was exciting. So, was um, But so t- th- let's talk about that business a little, because I did want to get to that. Uh, it's like it, this is not an easy thing to put out, I think, in this day, to, to make a CD with a beautiful printed booklet in it and pictures and all the all the lyrics all the text written out um and i think you did get some grants in order to be able to do this but i just want to understand what's the motivation of putting out a cd and how are you actually managing to distribute it and um, put it in the world. Oh, thank you. Well, when people are, you know, because they're buying a lot of like, and I do too, I download singles. And it's a little more rare to just buy a CD or a full album now. Yes. And and, and basically for me, it was really necessary to create the book. You know, I grew up, you know, um, reading liner notes. I, you know, yes, looking at album covers. And and, uh, and in my family, if they weren't my instrumental um, mentors um, growing up in the Fillmore neighborhood of San Francisco, they were most definitely my listening mentors, my uncles, my aunties, my parents, and um, Mm -hmm. and liner notes and and vinyl, you know, and and the tangible, you know, the feeling of being able to to feel these pieces was very much an important part of my growing up. And there were mm-hmm. also faces of um, relatives that I wanted, you know, maybe two generations later, you know, maybe my family would be interested in knowing who these people were. It was something that was already starting to get lost in my own family after I'm the fourth generation American Filipino. Um, I have nieces and nephews that are like fifth generation and, and they're only like very lightly you know, um, aware of their, their lineage. And um, so a part of me was, I had a bigger mission here that not only did I want to just remember these amazing people that started our American journey here, um, and to see them as heroes, as the heroes that they were, but maybe in the future, this wouldn't be make sense for the fifth, sixth, and future generations to see their faces, mm-hmm. to hear um, their stories, and to read their stories. And um, so that's why it needed to be a booklet. It needed to be a physical CD. And... Um, and people are getting a deeper experience. Like there, no one's really playing the CD because th- there are hardly any CD players. But they're buying. But they're it. looking. Y- at yes, it. they are. They're buying. That's it. what I did. I yeah. imported it into my computer, and honestly, I had to do it quickly because Tony wanted his copy back. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Robles sent me your CD, and he insisted that he wanted his back. So I don't oh. actually have that beautiful CD anymore. But it it was sort of like, okay, okay, I'll give it back because <laughs> really and I that's wanted part to of keep it. It's so beautiful, and it could sit on the Thank bookshelf, you. and that's yes. wonderful, you know. Yes, so and that was exactly I, I what you I for wanted. that. And I think you have the long vision 
for it, which is really as I a do. resource even, right, or should yes. be in libraries and those types of where it's available for research and just to, yes. to understand maybe. Yes, um, to understand, to and, see faces. And something even better, though, is to go see Carolyn Kabating live, which if you're in the Bay Area and you're lucky on October 5th, is it, you will be part of the Women in Jazz series. Can you tell us a little more yeah. about that? Um, yes, there. Uh, well, actually, that what it turned out that they um, uh, rhythmics uh, had to is will be rescheduling that particular concert. Oh, but, okay. Um, well, we'll scratch at, that yeah. from the okay. interview if you want. And <laughs> yeah, and I'll just ask. I, and you this, I, I found out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could tell us where you'll be appearing soon for people who might be where you're appearing. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, the International Hotel Manila Town Center is a community gathering space that is also a space where um, I perform at a monthly um, uh, uh, live performance uh, event called Club Mandalay. And our next uh, mm. performance will be this Saturday, August 31st. But also, um, our, after that would be um, September 28th. So we are there once a month, and um, more information can be um, uh, gleaned from manilatown.org. Um, we, my, my ensemble and me are always uh, performing at least a monthly show, as well as uh, more mm. shows as well as, the, as we are invited. And I, I did want to like uh, also mention, this was news that I just got a couple of weeks ago. We have been uh, nominated for a Grammy in the uh, global music category. Oh, my so, so, goodness. So I'm, I'm really happy. Well, congratulations. <laughs> You heard it Thank here you. on Listen and Be Heard. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that, and I wish you luck with that. Thank um, you, I just want to ask you one last question, because I yes. ask, have been asking this of all of our guests. It has nothing to do with your CD, but whether or not you have an opinion about or how it's affected you, these, um, these laws and different regulations about the banning of books across our country right now? Oh, well, I definitely don't believe in the banning of books. I think that um, I I grew up in, you know, the thing about it is that if anyone is getting, um, having issues around language that might be in books that have, um, are some of our classic books, I think that the perspective of explaining the era in which books were um, written during um, and and also that even being a topic of discussion that could be very rich is mm. important, but not the banning of it. I grew up being able to read all of these books and to have like lively, rich conversations. Tony Robles and I are basically brothers, brothers and sisters from another mother, kind of like a situation. We are of a similar age and we grew up in the same neighborhood and we are the people that we are because book reading was something that was a part of our life and the um and the, the expression and conversation around books um i don't believe in banning any books even the books that are uncomfortable to read Th there could be conversations around that and a growth and an evolution of community and as individuals even in those discussions Thank you, Carolyn. Basically, let's talk about it instead of like yes. making it, trying to make it disappear, right? Yes, yes. Yes. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I've really enjoyed your company, the conversation, the music, the poetry. And if people want to find out more, find out where else you might be appearing, how to get your CD, how should they go about doing that? I think the best bet would be the website, which is www.kabading.com, my last name, and everything will be there. C-A-B-A-D-I-N-G. -E dot com. And everything is indeed there. Thank yes. you so much, Carolyn. I've really enjoyed this time with you here in the Audio Garden. It has been my pleasure, Martha. Thank you so much for this opportunity.